So, good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. <laughs> afternoon. In Eastern and Central. Um, <laughs> I may have people retweeting me in Central Time and they may completely goof, and that's okay. We still love them. Um, so, hi, everyone. Welcome to Pokemon Physiology. You were in the right place. Hello, everyone standing in the back. Glad you could join us. Um, so my name is Connie Wall. Um, I have to get back to my main slide. I don't know how that works. OK. Hi. My name is Connie Wall. Um, I am a graduate student over at St. Louis University. Um, I have a long standing tradition of throwing shellfish down staircases to see how they work. Uh, um, that, that was all of my first bio degree, um, and people at the University of Scranton and Scranton, Pennsylvania still get flashbacks whenever they pull out that little pool um, to do follow-ups. So I started my life out basically as an invertebrate marine biologist in the middle of Pennsylvania. Realized that wasn't going to make me money. Um, so I went into orthopedic medicine. Um, I've worked on macroscopic things like arms, and I work on microscopic things like cells and the proteins that cells make. Um, I'm also a TA for like too many courses. Um, I teach um, both physiology and uh, thermodynamics, so I'm fried. <laughs> this is probably, I feel like I'm following in the steps of my advisor and it's not a good thing because I looked at this yesterday. So we may be rough around the edges, but we're going to have fun. Um, if you get lost at any point in this uh, presentation, do not worry, pick up on another topic. Um, I will be posting on my Twitter an actual little handout that I like to refer as the textbook that's going to cover everything that we talked about today. So if you need to leave, if you fall asleep, if your friend you know, found something in the dealer's room and you need to stampede out of here, I still have things for you to read. So that's pretty good. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about real science, um, but I'm also here to talk to you about Pokemon. These are my children, because I'm playing two games at once, um, like a monster. Um, so <laughs> I'm still beating the champion in Sword and Shield because it was a really rough semester. Um, but we're here because we're Pokemon trainers, right? Um, and we have a lot of questions about these Pokemon that we love. And the one rule in this panel, the one rule that is non-negotiable, is that biologists did not make Pokemon. It was inspired by Pokemon, or it was inspired by real biology. It was um, Pokemon as a series was inspired by bug catching. Um, but the people that then thought up Pokemon definitely were not thinking about the laws of physics. So please, keep this in mind. Um, legendary Pokemon will not be covered in this panel because that's theology, and I don't cover theology. <laughs> That's somebody else's job, for sure. So off we go. So Pokebiology is the study of Pokemon life. You have all of these professors with their projects, their assistants. Um, they're all studying different things, and they're enlisting you as brand new 10-year-olds to go out and do their work for them. Um, we look at things like relationships. We look at habitats, evolution, origins of life. Um, they're all really noble pursuits. But I care about, as a person, things like the continuity of life. Where do eggs come from? We don't know because no one ever bothered to find out. Um, mega evolution or acute abilities, so that's our Dynamax, right? Um, and then we have attacks and structure function relationships. So this is the fun part for me, honestly. Um, the branch of biology which deals with organisms, so you and me or our Pokemon, and their structural function. So how do they work? Um, it's, uh, oh, thank you, okay, I Sorry. will do my best, okay. So, backing up a little bit, so physiology is the branch of biology which deals with organisms and their structural function. So Elm, Elm is definitely um, concerned with eggs. He's concerned with where eggs come from and why he hasn't camped out at the Daycare center, still, I don't know, he just doesn't do field work. Sycamore, I like to joke that Sycamore doesn't do anything, but he is, thank you. That one hasn't gotten a laugh in a very long time. Um, but he does study mega evolution, and if I were a grad student, I'd probably be under Kukui, because he studies um, the attacks and the structure function relationships needed to actually um, study how those attacks land and how they function. And then there's Magnolia, and I really like Magnolia and I love Sonia because 
they are finally yet another, other than Professor Juniper, another female professor, and they're both studying Dynamaxing, and I think that's awesome. Um, so these are all Pokemon physiologists in some way. But life is complicated. We need to define life. So there's actually qualifications for life. There's a hierarchy of the structure. So what happens at a small level should, in theory, happen at a large level. And there are lots of surprises. So Pokemon life um, is way more complex than real life. This is to say the least. Um, our friend here is, you know, rock sliding in a field, a flat field, which to me would be the same as rock sliding where I live in the Midwest, where there are no rocks. Um, so most attacks aren't following our laws of physics because once again, laws of physics don't apply. Um, ghost types and ghost type adjacents, so a Rotom, Porygon, I, I <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's not much to say about that other than what do. Uh, <laughs> so we're just going to let those be for right now. So here's the thing. Where do we even start? Oh, I opened the wrong one. Okay. So where do we even start here? We have all of these fantastic abilities. Once again, Rayquaza, legendaries need not apply right now. <laughs> um, Mewtwo, however, is a legendary that will apply because why? We made him. He's an artificial Pokemon. We grew him in a tube after. We'll get to you after. Um, we made him in a tube. Same as Ditto. So I did have a slide on here that was going to be a Ditto comic, and I opened the wrong PowerPoint. So that's life right there. Um, but Ditto also, once again, test tube Pokemon. We'll talk about that later. So we talked about Pokebiology, study of life. We have to define life. What is it? So we have these rules, right? You have to have a basic unit of function. You cannot just be a bunch of molecules floating around and calling it life. The structure of that needs to relate to the function. So here's our friend Caterpie. Caterpie has ridges on its feet that increase the surface area of his toes so he can run around on different surfaces. So increasing the surface area means he can increase attachment, um, run around, and scare Misty. Um, continuity of life. I feel like I've already exhausted most of my egg jokes already. Um, but the continuity of life, life goes on. My brother runs a Goomy farm. Um, you can have Pokemon that can lay eggs that propagates the species. You have a use of energy. You and I are using energy right now whether or not you know it. Even when you're sleeping, you are using energy. Whether or not that energy is useful, please see GIF. Um, yeah, whether or not it's useful, he's still using energy. So life has to use energy in some form. Uh, life also has to grow. You can't just stay in one form or one size. You really should be able to grow and adapt to your environment. So you should be responding to your environment. Even in the new games, you're running around in the tall grass. What happens? You get attacked. You get attacked. Yeah, some, you step on something and it attacks you, as it should. Um, you're running around in its habitat. Um, and then you're adapting and evolving. So Eevee is my prime example here. There's a lot of adaptation. There's a lot of evolu evolution. Um, we'll get to that. Um, there's a lot of evolution. But all of these things, not necessarily in this order, are needed for something to be defined as alive. So these are really just basic building blocks for us to define life and talk about it. So. Basic unit of function, we have molecules, we have atoms. Is that showing? Yes, good. OK. We have molecules, we have atoms, we have tissues, we have organs. All of these things build together. Structure relates to function. OK, DC. You're going to have to show it to Connecticut. In Connecticut, apparently hitting someone with a printer is more efficient than hitting someone with a pool noodle. If you were to want to fight someone, maybe not kill them. Fight someone, would you use a pool noodle or a printer? Pool noodle, raise your hand. Oh my god. Printer, raise your hand. Oh my god. Okay, all right. <laughs> I, I have to change this question. Um, so, interesting shift. The Midwest would all go for the pool noodles because they're kind and don't want to leave bruises, I guess. I don't know. Um, printers, East Coast, you guys are savage. Um, as, as we should be, but okay. Yeah, yeah. you just check the print, okay. So 
Here's the deal though. So there is a certain task for these objects, yes? Yes. So like using a knife to eat jello, probably not the best idea. Better analogy, use a spoon or a fork if you're adventurous. Okay, cool. All right, good. So there's also the continuity of life. So life goes on, life finds a way. Um, in biology, we have the central dogma, which means our DNA is going to write an RNA, is going to turn into a protein, and the proteins are able to do things. We use energy to do that, that I just said, central dogma. We also um, get and create energy through cellular respiration and photosynthesis. We grow, so cells on their own, they will divide, um, depending on what kind of cell it is. Um, they will divide, undergo mitosis, and, and suddenly you go from one to two to four exponentially. We respond to our environment. On the tiny scale, that's things like cells talking to each other. Um, on the larger scale, we have nervous systems, we have endocrine systems to help the cells talk to cells that aren't right next to them. So it's like a cell phone. Huh? <laughs> uh, oh, someone's leaving, good. <laughs> so all of this means that we're adapting and we're changing, we're growing with our environment. The result of all of this change is that goal, or that goal, oh, okay, I folded in on myself, but you get the point, right? Okay. So let's talk about the cell after I made a really bad cell joke. Um, so it's our basic unit of life. It has smaller organs inside of it called organelles. Um, it runs via the magic of biochemistry that we're not gonna go into because that's a whole nother five hour lecture. Um, it makes proteins. So the job of a cell essentially is to make proteins. Those proteins are going to go outside of the cell and do things. It's either going to build the tissue or the house that the cell lives in, or it's going to go do something else. So mucus is my favorite protein. You all might be grossed out by that, but have you seen like a hagfish? Mucus is really, really cool. And cells make that to work around them. Um, so that's a plug for mucus. Um, so once again, central dogma, DNA to RNA to protein. Oops, there we go. I'm like, oops, no. Okay, DNA to RNA to protein. Um, that's the whole goal here. Life goes on. All right. So the cell uses energy. How does it use energy? Well, it's this lovely uh, molecule called ATP, and it's perform or it's made through something called cellular respiration. Now it happens in the mitochondria. What is the mitochondria? Can someone tell me? The Good. You all passed. My job is done here. Um, it's not, we still have a couple minutes, but like, good. You all learned that from high school biology. But like, what is the point? What is the point of cellular respiration other than, like what do we use ATP for? Energy. Energy, how? Can someone tell me? Someone who's not in the front row. Yeah. Huh? Sorry? Oxygen kind of. That you, you got there. So that's kind of how cellular respiration works. But how do we use the ATP? Sorry. Unclear question, might be. Yeah. Well, don't you break off a yeah. phosphate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you break off a phosphate. So has anybody ever shot a rubber band at their sibling and or friend? And then it snaps back at you and it hurts? Yeah. That's because all of that energy you stored up you let it go and it snapped directly into you. So that's kind of what's happening with our ATP. It's a high energy situation that gets released. All right. So it is a multi-stage process to build this rubber band, if we're going with that analogy. So what, what we have here is we have something called glycolysis, where you eat sugar. Who here likes sugar? Yeah. Who here has already ingested far too much sugar? <laughs> Me. Um, so what we do is we break down that sugar and we start playing with oxygens, as our friend back there said. We start playing with oxygen. We toss around the oxygen, we toss around these electrons, and eventually we get to these lovely molecules, which I did not draw out. I am not an artist. I took organic chemistry and biochemistry. Still can't draw a hexagon. So you get the words. And all of these pretty molecules, what they do is they keep snapping um, smaller rubber bands. They keep releasing energy that we then use to make hydrogen miserable. So how many of you come from big families? Or, okay, even small families, small cars. How many of you carpooled to the convention? Yeah. How many of you shoved yourself into a vehicle that you didn't want to be in? 
Yeah, so the release of that door opening is like the best thing ever, right? Okay, that's what happens to hydrogens. So we use all of this oxygen bopping around and we take that energy that we take from hitting the oxygen around and we shove hydrogens in a small space with that energy, right? So when we shove those hydrogens into the small space, they don't like being there. They don't wanna be there, they wanna get out. And so we say, okay, here's the door. But much like these doors right here, there are more people in here than there are space for those doors. So when you're running out that door, what they do is they kind of high five this protein. And that protein is what makes our ATP. It's called ATP synthase. And ATP, if you were wondering, looks like that. I would have to be, um, I would have to have probably 10 hours of my life to make that look pretty. Um, so that is ATP. But you don't really need to know that. We're gonna fly off, leave that there. But that is how we get our energy. So what do we use it for? Once again, proteins. Make and export the structural building blocks for tissues. As someone who works in orthopedics, that's like the biggest deal ever for me because you know bones and cartilage are kind of all that protein structure, that mineralized tissue structure. So yay, structural building blocks, the best. So Mudsdale, much like um, my new Clydesdale friends over in St. Louis, very strong hooves, very nice hair. Keratin is a very, very, very nice molecule. It's very tough. Um, they use it for impact. Spoink, who knows what happens to spoink if it stops bouncing? It dies. It dies. We don't want our spoink friend to die, correct? Good. So, oh no, oh, he's so cute. So the whole idea is Spoink doesn't want that to happen. So Spoink actually can keep it from happening. So that tail is a spring. Springs like to bounce. Not only do springs like to bounce, but the, um, well, the springs like to bounce, but they can store energy. Here we go. Oh, good morning. Um, so springs like to store energy. So Spoink actually is a tail with elastic material in it. So it doesn't have to think about bouncing. It just lets that natural material, let it, to, lets the natural material keep it bouncing. Right? So much like a spring or a slinky going down the stairs, right? Spoink is just gonna keep going. Cool. So those proteins in its tail let it do that. That's, that's where I was going. Calcified tissue, once again, went off on an orthopedic rant and gave away my entire slide. Um, so calcified tissue are rock types and steel types. They're going to use those proteins to somehow insert minerals into their bodies and make themselves tough. Specialized structures. So our smeargle here, it secretes ink, it secretes paint. Those paints are actually probably proteins, pigmented proteins that it uses to paint. Cell signaling. Here's another way we can use energy. It takes a lot of energy to smack the person next to you and go, hey, do you see that dog? That takes energy. So does cell signaling. <laughs> um, you have to have energy to build up those cell numbers. And heat. Cellular respiration is what we call a combustion reaction. Who knows what combustion is? Fire. Explosions, right? Heat. Um, so, fire types. They just need a lot of sugar because they burn up a lot of things. Maybe not to 2300 Celsius, um, as Macargo is supposedly that hot. Probably not. Ten year olds are at the Pokedex. Um, <laughs> but, combustion reaction, fire types. So, getting energy. How do we get this energy? Well, we eat or ingest soylent or somehow eat vitamins to get our nutrition, right? Um, Pokemon do this in various ways. Uh, people in the anime get their nutrition from various places. Um, we're Magikarp. Um, Caterpie is being uh, carried off to be dinner. I don't remember how that manga ends, sorry. Um, and then what about our grass types? So I mentioned photosynthesis earlier. Photosynthesis makes sugar, right? So do we need to feed our grass types? What do you think? Oh, mixed bag. Sometimes. Oh, okay. There's a lot of buffering going on. Bulbasaur, yes. Bulbasaur, yes. Okay. So, yes and no. All right. So let's take a look at this. Yes and no. So photosynthesis produces sugar using the energy that plants get from light. And they do this with the chloroplast. Now keep in mind, I was an invertebrate biologist and I work on people now. So if there are botanists in the room, I am so sorry. Um, so chloroplasts are a special organelle that plants have, or grass-type Pokemon have, that are able to convert light energy 
um, into sugar using a fun biochemical reaction, which we'll see later. Um, you can also do this with other plastids. So there are types of algae that you can find um, in the northern Atlantic that actually have different colors. So they can use different wavelengths of light to make their colors. Um, other plastids produce pigment. So tomatoes go through a process where um, the longer they grow, the more um, lycopene there is and they get sweeter. So you green tomatoes versus red tomatoes, essentially. Um, those are still plastids. They may not photosynthesize, but they exist. So why am I telling you this? <laughs> Who cares about plants? <laughs> um, so photosynthesis is a two-part um, situation. It's a charge-up stage and a building block stage. Um, the charging stage is called the electron transport chain. Let's bop electrons. It's essentially taking those electrons like you would a beach ball and going boop. That's all it is. It goes through approximately eight different proteins. Um, there's probably more than that. Sorry, botanists. I'm like butchering your thing. Um, but it, what they do every time they hit it is they put energy into that electron, right? Like you're hitting the ball, you're putting energy into it, and it's flying off somewhere, right? Then once you have that energy, you put it into a Calvin cycle, which once again, I'm not going to draw that. I'm not going to make you suffer. Um, there's a lot that goes on there, but at the end of the day, you're building up a carbon chain, much like stacking Legos together. Um, and you get sugar, or a precursor to sugar. You could get sucrose, you could get glucose, you could get fructose. Do all of these sound familiar? If you were to read the back of your haichu, you'd see all of those. <laughs> um, so they're all sugar. It's just we deal with it differently. That's a whole other thing. OK, cool. So happy now. Told you all about photosynthesis, right? So why? Why do we need it? Do the grass types really need to eat if they're just going to sit in the sunlight and make their own sugar? Um, yes, <laughs> you do need to feed them because you're building glucose, you're building fructose. There's a very limited amount that they can make. And uh, Bulbasaur isn't completely a plant, right? He's kind of a critter that moves around and has organs and a brain. Brains don't work on sugar alone. So cellular respiration, although it primarily runs on glucose, you have other things going on here. Other good things come from food. So phosphorus, nitrogen, we have our DNA. We need DNA, right? I've already mentioned DNA like three times at least, right? So it must be important. So other things come from food. Um, yeah, this guy does not get that big solely off of sugar alone. <laughs> so building blocks for amino acids, AKA our proteins. So we have our carnivorous plants. So who, who here actually has a Venus flytrap? Does anyone have like a, like a pet one? No? So do you feed them? Do you just have a lot of fruit flies in your house? Precursor. Oh, did. Did is the keyword. OK. Yeah, makes sense. So you do need to feed them mealworms, or you need to feed them mosquitoes, fruit flies, something, because that's actually how they get it. They digest their food. So we eat. We make energy. Now what? Well, now we could do all the fun stuff. So cells form tissues, form organs, form systems. And then we get something. Oh, here it is. So remember that comic? I, I, I thought I put the comic somewhere else, but it's here. Good. So we can do fun things. So this is a uh, stri um, from a Dorkly comic strip. A ditto can be any Pokemon. So it has to be super rare, right? So it can do fun things. So what is a ditto? It's a failed experiment. Did it really fail? I mean, OK, OK, they couldn't publish it. So yeah, OK, it failed. But it's really cool. It's basically just a blob of stem cells, so cells that can do whatever they want, right? Um, mesenchymal stem cells can just differentiate into whatever they want, and they need the energy to do that. So I'm starting at ditto because it can do whatever. Not for a long period of time, but it can do whatever. Um, but even those specialized cells that it can form, form specialized tissue, form specialized structures that could then go and, you know, kick Leon's butt, right? So, you know, we have espers, we have Pikachus, all of these fun friends. We can do a lot with specialized cells. So electricity, let's start there. Keep the lights on. So electricity, at its most basic definition, is a separation of positive and negative charges. 
So we do this all the time. Our cells do this all the time. It keeps negative things away from positive things, and then when something has to happen, they shoot them together. But uh, they weren't really that um, subtle with that one, which is fine, that's good. Plus, limb mining together, powerful team. Alone, not so much. So electricity, once again, um, separation of positive and negative charge. It's January now. How many of you have wool socks? I do, I love them. How many of you have wool carpet and or any kind of carpet? How many of you walk with wool socks on that carpet? Because I'm dumb, yeah. Okay, and then uh, what happens when you touch the doorknob? Zap. So static electricity, while you're shuffling around on your carpet wearing all of your woolen things, is separating out those charges. And then when you touch that doorknob, that doorknob has a lot of negative. Negative? Good, engineering school, two degrees. Poof. Um, lots of potential, yes. So you have more on one side, one on the other. You touch that doorknob and they equalize and you get zapped. So electricity, this happens a lot with our electric type Pokemon. Um, in cells, separations of ions across a membrane causes a difference in charge. That's more of these guys. So if you have muscle cells, that's where we're getting the electric yield, the electric. Haha, <laughs> they weren't settled with that one either. Um, that's where you're getting these electric types from. Um, so what you're looking at there is called an electromyogram. So if you've ever gotten, has anybody ever gotten an electromyogram test before? Okay, so you are the two lucky people, I have two, we're the three to four lucky people in this room that have had pads stuck on, okay, contract your muscle, and then they see these little lines. So they're testing for muscle activation. It has nothing to do with force, just how active it is. Um, so there is, when you're contracting your muscle, actually some electric potential that goes through. So we can actually see what you're doing and when. Um, if you go to a lot of aquariums and they have an electric eel, they'll also have a system that looks like that, and you can actually see the electric eel discharge. It's really cool. All right. So um, muscles fire because of neurons. Neurons. Hey, brain, psychic. And that is about as close as I get. Sorry, folks. <laughs> um, so I showed you an electromyogram. This is an electroencephalogram, which means brain electricity essentially. So you can also tell what parts of the brain are firing if you use even more specialized sticky pads on your head. Has anyone ever gotten an EEG? You don't have to share, but like, yeah, so you've been through the whole sticky bits on the head. Okay, same process, but you can't see these as well as you can the muscle because once again, you've got a skull and a couple layers of tissue before you hit the actual brain. All right, um, so let's talk about these two. Um, I classify them both as alive. If you want to see the first slide again, you can. Um, in my other panel, I talk about Voltorb and Electrode a little more in depth. So if you want to argue me, you can, just do it after the panel. Um, so once again, you're actually separating out charges. Um, in an alternating current, you get a relationship with a magnetic field, and that's where uh, magneton comes in. So come afterwards if you're excited about circuits. Um, mineralized tissue, so this is more my jam. Um, so you need that protein scaffold and then you take whatever you can get. Um, minerals, metals, hard materials. Um, is everyone from the East Coast, like on the water, more, more or less? So should you just go down to the docks and take out an oyster and eat it? Okay, so first of all, the people who said yes, please don't. <laughs> um, so. Shellfish, especially um, bivalves, they eat all the crap in the water. So if you're going down to a dock and you're going down to a shipyard and you're eating those shellfish, you are eating whatever those boats are putting out. So please don't. <laughs> um, razor clams, also not a good idea. But what they do is if they are in that water and they're taking up those minerals, they incorporate it into the shell. So sometimes you'll find shells that have like neat little um, rings on them, like pretty, that actually means that bivalve was in polluted water because it's incorporating iron, it's incorporating um, those little bits into its shell, which is really cool. That's how we get steel types, but don't eat those. <laughs> okay, um, you do this too, so bones. Your bones are constantly breaking down and building themselves up again, which is really inspirational because you too can build yourself back up again. Um, but they are doing this constantly. You're incorporating phosphates, you're incorporating calcium, and you're being strong as all heck. So good on you. 
Um, and oh, I already gave that. I really need to reorganize that. That's okay. Um, Token and Maru, um, I'm talking. I talked briefly about magnets in the last slide. This is kind of where that comes in. If you're incorporating something that's magnetic into your shell, well, you're inviting all sorts of fun electricity things to happen to you too. So, biofluids and properties of liquids. This is an entire course by itself. Um, I helped teach it this last semester, so um, my thoughts may be a little more scattered here. Um, but if you have tube, you will travel. Water goes from high pressure to low pressure, sometimes very fast if you're a blastoise, right? So where that comes from, we're not gonna talk about that. But if the blastoise has it, it will travel. Bernoulli was a very cool dude, um, and he came up with all these scary equations to tell you that. So congrats, you just passed like half of a fluids course. <laughs> nice. Um, properties of liquids, once again, cats, I guess, um, fits into a given volume, it has viscosity, so it has a rate at which it will move, and it has a certain density, so how closely things are packed in together. Closely things are packed in together. Um, we also have water as a universal solvent. So sugar, what happens when you put sugar into water? It dissolves, like that, if some of you may be thinking, like I am thinking of now, the raccoon, yeah, it will dissolve. So other things also dissolve in water. All the important things that we need live in water, essentially. Um, osmolarity is kind of that measure there. All right, so here we are. Here we are. Um, so we're about to talk about some, I don't wanna say controversial, but there are many ways you can look at it. This is one opinion, okay? <laughs> Remember, Pokemon was not designed by biologists or engineers for that matter. Um, I'm both, I can tell you there was no thought put into that. Do not try and rationalize it. It should be taken at face value. We're gonna talk about ghost types. Uh, yay! Um, so, uh, back before this new generation, so I haven't had time to finish the game, let alone set up this panel again. So I have not looked at the new ghost type Pokemon entries, but if you go through the Bulbapedia, Cerebi, whatever you use, you read through those Pokedex entries, here are the things that I've picked out. <sighs> okay, so how do these things match together? Well, Ghastly is 95% poisonous gas. Gengar is a heat sink, which means everything around it gets colder. Um, Mistrevious, I read so much on Mistrevious. I can only find that it makes a loud noise. That's it. That's the only useful thing. Everything else was like getting into like the creepy stuff that I filed under theology, spirituality. So it shrieks, okay? Um, Shuppet has no tolerance for light. Duskull can pass through walls. Once again, the only useful thing in the older generations that I can find. Driftloon is filled with air and screams when it's popped. <laughs> mm. So like, yes, okay, it kidnaps children, but it screams when it's popped, so kids keep a sharp object on you at all times. Um, Litwick, um, flame grows it as, as it absorbs energy, so that's actually useful. Um, and Mimikyu is weakened by sunlight, um, which is also why it wears its cute little costume. So, um, what the heck? <laughs> so, there's a gas element here. There's some kind of thermodynamics going on here, um, as thermodynamics changes energy, changes heat. Um, there's something to do with energy release. Um, we'll get into that. So, uh, basically, that whole rubber band issue, it snaps, right? You hear it as sound. That's a lot of energy. If something's being slowly released, you're gonna see heat. Ghost types have a lot of energy, therefore screaming. <laughs> um, also explain small children, by the way. Um, <laughs> light sensitivity, also not sure what to do with that, but you know, at least we had two that were in common. So here we go. After teaching thermo, this, this slide is woefully underdone. Um, so here's the first rule. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. This means that whatever's there had to come from somewhere. It didn't just pop up unless you're Arceus, in which case that's the theology course and not this one. 
um, the entropy of an isolated system always increases. So basically when something happens, be it chemical, be it mechanical, crashing into things, there's always going to be a little bit of that energy dissipating off into the universe forever. Goodbye. You can never get it back. Um, so what's sticky about this is that ghost types break these rules. Um, energy within a system that is unavailable for work, well, if you are a ball of gas and you're letting go and taking back without any real change, you're definitely not using entropy right. Um, and that's where I leave it. <laughs> so the laws of physics are breaking. I'm sure there's a way to get around it if you were to stick five layers of calculus in there. Please don't. Um, no, don't do that. Don't whip out MATLAB. No, you're on vacation. Um, so entropy, energy within a system that's unavailable for work. Um, ghost types do exhibit this energy release, so we can't really say there's something going on. So with that, we are more or less done. Woo! So you learned that life is complex. We have rules for defining life, but it's still super complicated. Life uses energy. Cellular respiration happens in what? Which organelle? The mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. All right. Photosynthesis. Plants. Um, no, it's really cooler than that, and I'm not doing it justice. Um, life has levels. Levels and organization reveal the function. Charged ions create potentials, so don't stick that fork in the electrical socket because you are not, uh, you are not at 120 volts, I promise. Um, don't try, no, that's not a perfect insulator. Do not stick anything in a socket, ever, um, unless it's a plug and it's safe. Um, mineralized tissue is super cool, talk to me after. Um, I'll explain my thesis to you. Um, biofluids and properties of water, have water, will travel. Um, ghost types, cool, but oh my god. <laughs> Lord only knows. Um, so you learned a lot today. Um, here are my references. That comic came from Dorkley. Um, the artist is Andy Cluthy. Shameless promotion. Um, shameless promotion there. Um, if you do want any of these um, papers that I took the photos from, please let me know. Um, everybody who's here has supported me. I apologize to my bosses for literally like disappearing for two weeks for Christmas. Uh, that's a thing. Um, and I will take questions. Yes. Uh, Charlotte, yep. can you? You may just have to repeat it. I don't think that's going to go. OK, so I am a horribly indecisive person. I am a horribly indecisive person, so I let Charlotte do it for me. So if you would like to ask a question, you have to get her attention. OK, cool. Knowing what you know as specialized as you are, is there a certain type that you think the Pokemon is missing out on? Is there a certain type that I think Pokemon is missing out on? Ah, that's a really good question. I think they could be more specific with ghost types. I feel like ghost types could probably be better defined, um, but they're doing that with double typing. So that's a, that's a really good question. Thank you. Yep. 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 You mentioned how Ditto is basically just a lob of stem cells. Uh, the Masuda method is something trainers use to read Chinese mm -hmm. foreign language Ditto. Is there any science behind that? Well? Any science behind that at all? Probably not. <laughs> but um, it, I guess it kind of depends. So there are different types of stem Oh, sorry. Yes, and you're raving that sign. So someone asked, the Masuda method is when you use a different language Ditto to breed different Pokemon. If we are under the impression that ditto is just a ball of stem cells, how does that factor in? Um, so there are different types of stem cells. You have stem cells that'll just go from whatever, right? Um, we get those from an embryonic state. Really hot topic. I do not mess with those. Um, mesenchymal stem cells are not truly what we call pluripotent, so they don't do everything. Um, but they do do certain things. So for me, they will differentiate into cartilage. So you may have that going on for you. You may have adipose-derived stem cells that will do other things. So you have all these layers. So there might be something to it. They absolutely did not think about that. <laughs> but thank you. Yes. Have you considered looking at uh, like more direct translations of the Japanese text of Pokemon to consider? Yeah. Have I? Have I? Um, looked into directly translating from Japanese when reading the Pokedex. Yeah. yeah. Um, I haven't. I am not anywhere near 
competent in another language, let alone Japanese. I wish I was, because um, I'm sure I'm missing out on a lot of the nuances in there um, and a lot of the references. So I would love to work with someone. If someone wants to drop a business card, I've got like 500 of them. Um, so if you're interested in collaborating, sure. Um, but I have not myself, no. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so the question was, do I have any Pokemon that I would want to just completely work out and dissect and understand how it works? Probably anyone on my team, because then you can be like, I know you can do this and that. And you can learn that move because X, Y, Z. So yeah, I mean, anyone on my team. Have you gone that's... as far as trying to do any of it, like pretending? <sighs> uh, a little bit. That's kind of how, have I gone as far to actually do that? A little bit. That's how this panel started. Well, the ghost type question was actually how the panel started. But the rest of it was that. But yeah, absolutely. Can we get this guy? Yeah, let me get you first. Hi. Do you have a question? Yeah, what's your question? So um, the question was, I know that go, um, ghost types are strong against certain types of Pokemon. So um, kinetic energy. So how does kinetic energy work? So. You hit my favorite question, because <laughs> I'm a mechanics nerd. So kinetic energy is what happens when you move, right? So if you're moving, you have energy, right? So that means when your Pokemon have energy and they you know, are fighting with another one, and they kind of like punch them or use their moves, they're using a lot of energy. And that energy is moving and making the other Pokemon move. And those Pokemon don't want to move. And that's where that damage comes from. That is such a good question. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Are there any real life equivalents of evolutionary stones or held items during training? Oh. Um, so, uh, are there any equivalents of evolutionary stones or held items when training? That is a big question. So, the cellular person in me says yes. Like when I go to feed my cells, I put supplements in. If you want to know more about that, let me know. Um, I put supplements in and the cells go, hey, there's this certain thing in my environment that I like, I'm going to use it to build something else. So like, yes, that's the small one. The big version, you have all sorts of gimmicks. You have like cross training where you put weights on certain appendages and you do certain exercises to strengthen your muscles. Um, cross training is really good for your bones. So like if you're using something to help you train that way, like yes, um, not necessarily. I mean, then you have things like carcinogens in the environment that can cause your cells to do different things. So not the happy kind, I guess. Um, probably not the happy kind, um, but kind of. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right here. Um, common uh, argument. I you my friends are getting to is, in your professional opinion, do you feel it is ethical and safe to drink water from a water cooler? No. <laughs> no. No. Because, yeah, no, um, there's a dorkly comic for that, too. Um, I don't know if I want to repeat that. Is it safe to drink water from a water-type Pokemon? So if you were dying in the desert, could you you know, use your Squirtle, I probably wouldn't because water is the universal solvent. Water takes up things, not just like our nutrients and our glucose, it also picks up our wastes. It picks up nitrogen, urea. Do you want to drink urea? The answer is no, your body is getting rid of it. So I wouldn't personally drink from a water type. No, because that's not going to get rid of the actual compounds that are in there. Unless you had, I guess, what are they called? No, the, the fun towers. Yeah, whatever that is. The fun tire, the distillation towers, maybe, but even then I wouldn't touch it. But thank you. Yep. Okay, so once one of my friends had a Charizard that couldn't learn fluff. <laughs> Why do you think that was? I can't, oh, uh, my friend had a Charizard that couldn't learn fly. Why do you think that was? Um, 
So I am musically talented. My boyfriend is not. My boyfriend is artistically talented. I am not. My students beg me to stop. So it, I think it's more of a, you know, you can, but that doesn't mean you should situation, maybe. Like, my cat, God bless her, can hunt, but she cannot for the life of us actually hunt. She brings us live things. So like, it's all up to the, to the individual animal and or Pokemon. Oh, so I, so going off like those types of questions, are there, in terms of super effectiveness and not very effectiveness, are there any type advantages or disadvantages that make a surprising amount of sense or make surprising no sense? So type advantages and disadvantages, which make sense and which don't. Um, I mean, the easiest one to think about is fire and grass. Like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Um, the one that always confused me and the ones that I always have to look up are is like the dark, or not dark and psychic, but like ghost type situations I get a little bit confused on and who does what. Fairy kind of messed that up a little bit even more for me. Um, poison type and fairy um, makes sense, but poison and steel also makes sense except for certain organisms, which I kind of go, like a, like an Aeron, I am assuming is kind of like a little groundhog that's just covered in metal, why can't I poison that? Um, I don't want to, but like, <laughs> yeah, that's recorded. That's gonna look good in court. Um, <laughs> good, um, but like things like that where it's like, okay, but you're supposed to be a squirrel or you're supposed to be X, Y, Z, this should work. So I can't think of one at the top of my head other than maybe the poison and the steel kind of annoys me. Okay. Okay. So, um, the question is, evolution. We didn't really cover in this panel, so evolution isn't really possible as we know it in the Pokemon universe in real life. But if it were, what what's going on? Is that or like, sorry? If, like, if it were actually possible, would it really be possible? Yes. If it were actually possible, would it really be possible? So that's the question there. Um, feel free to come up and have discussions in the hallway after, too, if you have thoughts on this, because I see a lot of people butt scooting. Um, I don't think it's energetically possible in our universe. In the Pokemon universe, we can actually not define it as evolution. So the um, my first advisor was really big into Darwin, so I had that like definition hammered into me, where evolution is change over generations in time. So that's like Pokemon breeding. What Pokemon evolution really is, is metamorphosis, where you go from a juvenile stage of an animal to an adult stage of an animal, or adult-like stage of an animal. So, Technically, I guess it is possible. It's just not as flashy. It's not as big. So the way that, or if you look at the types of animals that use metamorphosis, they're small, and they have the ability to expend that energy without it, you know, not harming them in the future. So uh, elephants aren't going to uh, uh, metamorphose because they're massive. That's just so much to deal with. Whereas caterpillars and butterflies, not so much. So there's that. Okay, we have time for maybe one more, so I have time to pack up and meet you guys out in the hallway. One more question. One more question. Yep. So, I know like, you sort of got to the point where you can like, artificially use Mesopotamia, and so for a Pokemon like Porygon, it's supposed to be really hard to use it. How, like, how do you think the mechanics work for that for it to be able to use this move in, like, the Pokemon and yeah, so with our ability to edit DNA, where does Porygon factor in into that equation is kind of where you're going. Okay, I just have to repeat the question so other people can hear. So I'm, I'm yeah. Um, so Porygon, I had this question the other day because I was looking over, Porygon can be your buddy on Pokemon Go, right? So my question is, is that an actual Porygon that you're looking at? Because Porygon is a digital Pokemon. So Pokemon now exist if you follow my logic, Pokemon now exists because Porygon is in Pokemon Go and you can actually interact with it. So Pokemon are real, which is a fun, logical <laughs> train to go down on. So I don't think because it doesn't have DNA that it would factor in, but once again, we are getting really 
into digitally editing DNA. So I see where you're going with that, but I don't know what to do with Porygon. I feel like Porygon is now on my list of Pokemon not to talk about, but that's okay. That just means it's a hard conversation and there's a lot going on and it cannot be neatly presented. So yes, please, uh, that sounds fun. <laughs> um, but yikes, yeah, not sure. All right, so here's the deal. There are still a lot of you here. There is another panel that needs to come in. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to put some business cards out. So if you're just a drive-by, swipe, um, get my Twitter handle, get my business card, email, et cetera. They're up here. If you want to ask me a question, I'm going to meet you out in the hallway so that way the other presenters can come in. So thank you so much. I love giving this panel. I will be here tomorrow to continue this.